It is showtime. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everybody. Uh, That song was a great uh, sort of rap song that I was the theme song to a great movie I saw last year called Fast Five, and I thought it would make an interesting uh, addition to our selection of music here. Uh, This is Dr. Minarsik. It is Tuesday. It's March 26th. It's 9 o'clock here in Chicago, and I have a big 54 on my uh, little cue sheet here. Reminding me to tell you this is the 54th uh, two-hour session in free global online medical school pathology. Uh, I guess this is a good time to do our test. And the first uh, question on the test is, 
Do you hear me? Thank you. Uh, and the second question on the test was, uh, what do you see on your screen? Yeah, I guess they're vases. Somebody said they're called colored pots. I don't know what they are, but they looked awfully uh, interesting. I just Googled the word colorful and then went to images, and I saw this somewhere on their list and thought, wow, that's a great thing to show today. Uh, okay, and I guess the uh, third question now is, do you hear me very well, and did you hear the music very well? Okay, everybody's saying yes, and the reason why I'm asking that is we did a webinar uh, with a famous, the world's most famous uh, prostate uh, pathologist uh, on Saturday, and there were tremendous uh, audio problems. So we may have to repeat it, but I just want to make sure that the problem was due to the other end of the line and not mine. So uh, looks like we're rocking and rolling. Uh, I um, was looking for Dr. August in the group here today. I didn't see her. If I see her later, I will uh, pop her up. I don't see her name on the list, but if she comes in later, I'll look for her, and uh, she will be there to answer your immediate questions. Um, okay, uh, we are completely finished, as you know, almost, with uh, the chapters on both red cells and white cells. And in the red cell chapter, we covered coagulation. And in the white cell chapter, we covered lymphoid organs. And we have a few lymphoid organs today to finish up on, like spleen and thymus. And then what we're going to do today is have an entire lab. So um, that's what we're going to do. But I do have a couple of small things uh, to announce that won't take much time, but they are of tremendous importance. The first announcement is that I got word from Dr. Vinay Kumar, who is the god of pathology worldwide, because he's the man that writes Robin's textbook. Uh, and he said he would be here for our graduation ceremony to speak to you and uh, inspire you. So when we are finished with the course, which I calculate will be in approximately eight or nine more sessions, probably somewhere in the middle of May, uh, we're going to have a graduation ceremony, a class devoted entirely to fun and music and games and speeches. And uh, Dr. Kumar will be here to deliver the, uh, his second uh, annual graduation uh, address to all of the buzzards. Um, there's only one chapter left, you know in systemic pathology after this, and that's the one on lung. But it's a big one. They'll t take at least three sessions. And then we have to go back to general path to finish a couple of relatively small chapters under general path, which we omitted because we uh, took that trip to Puerto Rico. And that will be on environmental and nutritional pathology as well on pediatric pathology. So we're really rocking and rolling. And speaking of rocking, a couple of people have asked me about Rock Lab. Uh, I've got a couple of uh, inquiries from students saying, oh my God, it's so big. And what I am uh, telling you is that you don't have to do the entire Rock Lab yourself. You could find friends. You may know of other people in your area that are taking this course. You may want to share it with one person, two people, ten people, a hundred people. You may have a hard time finding who those people are. So what I do thought I would do today is uh, make an announcement to those of you that are at the recording session right now. And I'm going to pop open the uh, attendee list, and I'm going to look at all your names. And I am going to ask you the question, is there anybody here on this big list of people I see that are here right now that would like to volunteer to have me email them the attendance list, the uh, registration and attendee lists, so they could contact people. Uh, OK, and I see there's been one volunteer already. Good. And actually, that one volunteer, I think, is somebody who's already finished Rock Lab. So I am going to send the entire email list to Ollie Jacobson. 
and he is going to be contacting you. I don't know, maybe he's an internet spammer and he just wants to get all your email addresses so he could, you know, sell you drugs, you know, and stuff like that. But uh, I will send the entire email list to Ali and he will then decide how to contact you to ask you if you want to form groups because I am really not very good at being a social director and you know I really don't have time to do that myself not that it's not a worthy thing to do so expect to hear an email from Ali Jacobston who I will write his name down right now and I'll send him the email lists of the attendees for today and also our regular attendees there might be 500 or if I go back from the beginning of the year, there might even be like a couple of thousand. So he'll figure out what to do. And I really, uh, it's out of my hands now. All I know is that everybody will have a method for finding buddies to help them do Rock Lab. And remember, if you do Rock Lab, then you also have to send me your uh, work results by any electronic uh, method you prefer. PDF, PowerPoint, you know, HTML. And then uh, that will qualify you to have a five or ten minute meeting with me uh, to discuss the stuff that you uh, turned in. And then uh, we'll be friends for the rest of our life. So that's the uh, only other announcement I wanted to make. <clears throat> I'm popping the uh, window back in. And now I am going to talk about pathology. That sounds like something we could do today also. If you remember where we left off in the last session five days ago, uh, we left off actually in the same place that the first metastatic tumor cell might wind up entering into a lymph node, and that was a subcapsular sinus. So there it is. It's a nice subcapsular sinus. You can see it uh, to the uh, right of it that there's another vessel. You might think that could be a perhaps a vein. It's certainly not an artery, but I think it also might be possibly an um, afferent uh, lymphatic vessel as well. It could be a small vein. Anyway, that finished the discussion on lymph nodes before we go into two other lymphoid organs. And the obvious one is the one we missed so far, the spleen. And then we'll say a few words about the thymus as well. Spleen is an interesting organ. You can remember everybody found it, you know, in your anatomy lab, and everybody knew that it was touching the diaphragm, and it was also touching probably part of the stomach, probably touching the splenic flexure. That's why the splenic flexure is called the spe Probably touching the very tail of the pancreas as well. So there's a lot of things that it borders, and uh, you'll never ever forget the weight of a spleen because it's exactly one-tenth of the liver. So if the liver is about 1,500 gram grams, a spleen should be 150. If it's also the same weight as a kidney, which is also 150 grams. Uh, a lot of times when you look at autopsy reports, you'll see that the pathologist will look at the spleen uh, before he dissects it and slices it, and he'll say, the capsule is smooth and glistening. And that's not just something to say repetitively, you know, all your life. It's actually very important because if there are parts of the capsule that are not smooth and glistening, that could be focal disease. It could be previously uh, something uh, disease from the inside of the spleen, like an infarct, or it could be something from the outside of the spleen, like a peritonitis. It could be inflammation of the splenic flexure, or the pancreas, or the stomach, or the diaphragm. It could have been a previous peritonitis, either visceral or parietal. Now, one principle that we're going to be using uh, about the spleen is that when you finally do yank it out and you start slicing it up into nice thin sections, much nicer than a CAT scan or an MRI scan, you're going to see before you put it under a microscope white areas and red areas, or what we call white pulp and red pulp. Now, the red pulp are the so called sinusoids, which contain not that much lymphoid tissue. The white pulp, which of course stains blue now when you finally put it under the microscope, are your lymphoid areas. 
they surround these arteries. They surround the trabecles of the uh, spleen. And that's a good general understanding. If you think red and white grossly or red and blue microscopically, and you have a feel that approximately, once again, there should be a 50-50 ratio. Now, I know somebody's going to say, well, it's not 50-50, it's really 70-30. But, you know, I think from the point of view of simplicity, just think when you slice through it, you should see both red, a lot of red and a lot of white areas, and microscopically, here we go. Now, of course, the white areas grossly are now these blue lymphoid clusters microscopically. And you also notice how these lymphoid clusters are generally in very close proximity to these little fibrous uh, trabecula in which the trabecular arteries run. Well, that's a general diagram of blood flow throughout the spleen because the arteries run within the trabecles and they generally then get surrounded by lymphoid follicles, finally branching out into the smallest branches called penicillary arteries. Now, that's the lymphoid uh, component of the spleen. The areas which are red are the uh, parts of the spleen that do what we normally think of the spleen as doing, and that's destroying blood cells. These are the sinusoids, okay? They're loaded with red cells. They're loaded with uh, uh, white cells as well. No, they are loaded with cells, you know, being recycled and reprocessed by the spleen, as we know that's what it does. So let's look at it now in a nice fresh picture, and we have the cut surface of a spleen. Now, the first thing you might notice uh, about this spleen, now I'm not going to tell you the weight because uh, the general rule is if a spleen is enlarged for any reason, the first question you want to ask yourself is, is it enlarged because of white pulp? or is it enlarged because of red pulp? Now here, take a look back at our normal histology picture again. Do you see how these lymphoid areas are generally, uh, these blue areas, which represent white pulp, are generally rather microscopic in size. They might look like maybe a millimeter or almost pinpoint in size. But take a look at this spleen now. Do you think that the white pulp that you see here and here and here and here and here and here and here, probably about 50% of the surface area, don't you think it looks a little bit more than a millimeter? So if this spleen is enlarged, your normal algorithm is, is it enlarged because of red pulp congestion or is it enlarged because of lymphoid proliferation? So it looks to me like the areas that are making this spleen enlarge are not red pulp, but they're white pulp. So that means there's probably going to be some infiltrate of sort, perhaps lymphoma, possibly leukemia. In this particular case, it happened to be granulomas, but I'll pretend like I didn't say that because I don't want to distract you from the general principle. Let's go back to the principle again. Here's another cut surface of the spleen only now it's microscopic rather than gross. And I told you that there should be about a 50-50 ratio, uh, maybe 60-40 or 70-30, you know, between this red pulp, which looks all red out here, and this white pulp, which is now blue because it's uh, lymphocytes. So let's say this spleen was enlarged too. And let me ask you the question, is it enlarged because of red pulp or is it enlarged because of white pulp? What do you see mostly here, red or white? Yeah, red. So that's a really good way of looking at it because rather than just memorize a big, unlogical laundry list of splenomegaly, just think of the spleen as a organ which contains both red and white pulp, and it normally weighs 150 grams. So let's say it's enlarged. Let's say it's 300. Let's say it's 500. The first question you ask logically 
is it enlarged because of the red areas or is it enlarged because of the white areas? And if it's enlarged because of the red areas, it's probably a congested spleen or perhaps it's enlarged because of hemolysis in which the red area has to become more relatively prominent to destroy the blood cells faster. So here, do you now understand why in an enlarged spleen in which there is a predominance of red pulp over white pulp is probably uh, due to either congestion of the spleen, like portal hypertension, or perhaps hemolysis or a hemolytic anemia. In other words, when you see this spleen, don't you think, oh my God, there's so much red pulp, it gotta be working more. Maybe it's destroying the blood cells faster. So yeah, this could be a hemolytic anemia. Now remember in the bone marrow, there's gonna be a predominance of the erythroid hyperplasia over the white cell production in the bone marrow. Well, look at the spleen. You have the same thing. There's a predominance of the red areas or the sinusoidal processing areas over the white areas. So that's how you think of splenomegaly because there's a big, long differential, and I don't want to have you memorize something if you don't understand the process. And also, um, when we talk about an enlarged spleen or splenomegaly, there's a big, long list. But when we talk about an abnormally small spleen, I guess you, you would use the word splenomicrally, except I've never heard it before. Uh, there's only basically one common thing that causes splenomicrally, and somebody wanna just spit it out right now because I've already said it a couple times, and somebody has already said it. Sickle cell disease, world's most number one cause of splenomicrally due to progressive small vessel infarction. Now here, let, let me ask you this. Let's say that, let's go, let's take sickle cell disease or let's take a hemolytic anemia of any type, okay? If you have a hemolytic anemia, it means your red cells are dying quicker than they should. If they are dying quicker than they should, that means they have to be going to the death factory, in other words, the spleen in greater numbers. That means that the red pulp will now be predominant over the white pulp. So in the beginning stages of a hemolytic anemia, you know, including sickle cell, you might have splenomegaly due to a pre predominance of the red pulp. But as the vessels sickle and cause progressive infarction in that spleen with time, years, that spleen is now down. Practically speaking, the uh, smallest spleens I've ever seen in my life were all due to sickle cell, uh, and uh, some of them were no bigger than a, a, a medium-sized grape. So if the normal weight of the spleen is 150, after you get into the twos and the 300s, you're thinking splenomegaly, but it's not unusual for a uh, sickler who's been sickling and progressively infarcting the spleen to have like a 25 gram spleen. Here's a general function, you know, not to review, this is not a physiology, remove old blood cells of all types, not just red cells. It's the uh, major secondary organ of the immune system after the lymph nodes. Also, do you remember that uh, in the uh, fetal stage, there may be a little bit of hematopoiesis going on in the spleen, like in the liver, but that quickly shifts to entirely within the marrow after you know the very first uh, you know few weeks of life. And also, it's the main area to sequester blood cells. So when you have a leukocytosis, you don't think that all of those. Uh, cells are coming from the bone marrow directly, more likely they're being sequestered in the spleen. And also remember that the, uh, at the areas that pool white blood cells, you know, the marrow and the spleen is many, many, many times greater than the number of white cells that are in the uh, uh, peripheral circulation. And also remember that there's a lot of phagocytic activity in the spleen as well. Uh, if you have seen a liver scan, you'll notice that once they label a colloid that is 
only uh, perhaps a third of a micron in diameter, and they inject it with a radioactive compound like technetium. They do a nice liver scan. Well, uh, about 80% of that activity, injected radioactivity, goes to the liver, but the majority of the rest of it goes to the spleen, and probably a little bit goes to the bone marrow as well. So after the liver, it's the number one phagocytotic uh, place for small particles, you know, including bacteria in the body. Okay, now we're into the concept of splenomegaly again. And we said that splenomegaly can be generally classified into either congestive or infiltrative. And a congested spleen will probably result in a ratio of red to white pulp that is a lot more than one to one. And it's usually due to things like uh, portal hypertension or hypersplenism congestion due to any reason. The infiltrative aspect of splenomegaly is usually involves the lymphoid area and not the red area. So those are the two concepts of splenomegaly. You see a big spleen, the first thing is, is it red or is it white? And also, remember, hypersplenism functionally, whether it's enlarged or not, is something that is going to be destroying red cells, platelets, and white cells. So think of the concept. Let's say that you have a enlarged spleen simply due to congestion, you know, like portal hypertension. Let's say you have cirrhosis, and now you have a congested spleen. Let me ask you that. Do you think that you might be anemic, leukopenic, and thrombocytopenic purely on the basis of the portal hypertension? That's the question. All I need is a yes or a no. Aha, you're thinking. I'll ask it again. Do cirrhotic people with portal hypertension become anemic, leukopenic, and thrombocytopenic? Yes, they do. Isn't that interesting? So, in other words, congestion in the spleen it goes hand in hand with hypersplenism functionally. Now, could you have a hypersplenism without splenomegaly? Well, I guess you could, but when the spleen has to work overtime in what it does, in other words, destroy red cells, maybe they're damaged red cells or white cells, chances are it's going to be, uh, become congested and enlarged as well. Now, you know, there's a lot of reasons for a splenectomy. And, of course, one of the main, re except for trauma, one of the main reasons for a splenectomy is a a uh, hyperfunctioning spleen. So a lot of the hemolytic anemias like, oh, even some of the hemoglobinopathies, but especially things like hereditary spherocytosis, which are all hemolytic anemias. Basically, uh, you have to decide whether taking out that person's spleen is going to help them with their anemia, and frequently it does. However, I want to tell you, in the last generation or two, you usually have to think very, very, very hard before you decide you're going to whack somebody's spleen out, even for trauma, okay? Uh, in the old days, if there was the slightest amount of trauma to that spleen, you know, by CT or by liver scan, they whacked it out. They figured, we're not going to take any chances. We don't want that person to bleed to death. Uh, but now they're thinking very, very hard because these, uh, there have been a lot of studies that show that if you just take out a person's spleen and you think, well, they don't really need it that much, when you follow these people, you know, 10, 20 years later, they have a tremendously uh, increased number of infections and other diseases, you know, even neoplasms. So the decisions for splenomegaly, for splenectomy, I'm sorry, is uh, taken with a lot more careful thought these days. Now, here's your big laundry list. This is the thing that I tried to get you away from, but it's inevitable. But try to think of it again as a uh, concept of either infiltrative versus congestive. 
What are the common infections that involve splenomegaly? Well, mono is a big one. You know, people that have infectious mononucleosis, you know, splenomegaly is a sine qua non for the uh, diagnosis, for the clinical diagnosis. And people that have had mono have had such enlarged spleens and rapidly enlarging very frequently, not very frequently, but it's not unusual for a person with infectious mononucleosis to have a spontaneous rupture because the capsule of the spleen seems to be one of the most sensitive things in the abdominal cavity. If you have blunt trauma to the abdomen and only one organ uh, capsule inside of your entire abdominal cavity ruptures, it's going to be the spleen nine times out of ten. I guess it could be a kidney. I guess it could be a pancreas. I guess it could be a liver. But nine times out of ten, the first organ to rupture in blunt abdominal trauma is the spleen. Tuberculosis, also a big, big cause for splenomegaly. Malaria, you know, we don't see much of that in the United States, but people with malaria get enlarged spleens. And for some reason, fungal infections, the systemic fungal infections, not the skin fungal infections, but the systemic ones. A histoplasmosis, black blastomycosis, coccidiomycosis, these are all associated with really enlarged spleens. Uh, I think I was going to ask you a question at this point, but I forgot. So maybe it'll come up later. Uh, portal hypertension. Uh, that's the most easy one to explain. You have portal hypertension, the venous drainage of the spleen. You know, you have only one blood supply to the spleen. That's portal vein. I'm sorry, that's splenic vein and splenic artery. If the splenic vein has increased pressure due to uh, cirrhosis, you're going to have an enlarged spleen on the basis of that. And remember, congestion of the spleen by itself is enough reason for hypersplenism functionally. So that's the main reason why cirrhosis patients are anemic and perhaps thrombocytopenic and uh, leukopenic as well. Same concept. Portal vein thrombosis, splenic vein thrombosis, these are all reasons for portal hypertension. Now, a general rule is, because the spleen is a lymphoid organ, it is frequently involved in the progression of lymphoid and hematologic neoplasms. So, routinely, Leukemia patients have splenomegaly. Not only do lymphoma patients routinely have splenomegaly, but it's usually enlarged because of the involvement by the lymphoma. Now, the biggest spleens, if you're going to practice medicine in the United States, but the biggest spleens I have ever seen in my life practicing medicine in the United States in hospitals where people die of regular USA diseases, are going to be the chronic leukemias, especially the chronic myelogenous leukemias. Remember that was a myeloproliferative disorder? So it is not unusual in a myeloproliferative disorder, especially CML, for the spleen to be or almost or even greater than the size of a liver. So when we would do liver scans on patients that had CML, we thought that the sometimes that the uh, tech reversed the image because the larger thing was on the left rather than on the right. People with the auto systemic autoimmune diseases get splenomegaly. Okay, some of the really, really huge splenomegalies are the lysosomal storage disease in which there is a buildup of uh, substances within macrophages, so Gaucher's disease, neiman pick disease, sometimes very, very large splenomegalies. And finally, uh, things like amyloid and metastases. But I'll give you a little bit of a uh, uh, tip right now. For some reason unknown to us, when malignancies 
generally metastasize widely, you know, and you know they're going to be involving the bone, and you know they're going to be involving the liver, and you know they're going to be involving the lung, and very good chance they might involve the brain. For some reason, metastases generally do not go to the spleen, okay? Sometimes in widespread malignancy, you'll see spleen involvement as well. But for some reason, metastases generally avoid the spleen. Now, if you see a spleen, however, that has metastatic disease, perhaps it's a scan, a CT scan, a liver scan, a spleen scan, a CT scan, you see metastatic space-occupying lesions within the spleen, but the other organs are free of metastases. In other words, there's generally three classes of malignancies which go quickly to the spleen and sometimes even preferentially in uh, preferring them to the other organs. And one of them we mentioned already, we said lymphoma. We said lymphomas love to go to the spleen. But malignant melanomas often metastasize early to the spleen before they go anywhere else. And a lot of times, uh, germ cell tumors of the testis, you know, the things like seminomas, the things like uh, yolk sac tumors, uh, these are things for some reason that have a kind of a predilection to the spleen as well. Okay, there we go. And remember, long standing, if your spleen is enlarged because of congestion, let's say portal hypertension, let's say hemolysis, long standing congestion can then breed or predispose to fibrosis. So that would be a situation in which a splenomegaly might recede or even in the case of sickle cell anemia, turn into a splenomicrally with time. Okay, there's a nice picture of a spleen. And if you look at it, it looks like it's, there's a regional area of disease. It looks like it's different color and different texture than the rest of the spleen. And in all honesty, to describe this, you would just have to say, well, there's a yellowish area uh, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but the largest area here looks like it has a relatively wedge-shaped configuration. And this is a classical appearance for a splenic infarct. And the infarcts of the spleen are generally in the category of what we call anemic, A-N-E-M-I-C, infarcts, for the simple reason that the spleen, you know, like the kidney, is an end artery organ. You know, there are no other blood supplies to the spleen except for the splenic artery. Now, the lung has two different blood supplies, the liver has two different blood supplies, but things like kidneys and spleen have only one. So that's why they would call this an anemic infarct. And that's why in the early stages, the infarcts of the spleen generally look whiter or paler than the rest of the splenic parenchyma simply because there's less blood, because there's an infarct. There looks like there may be a couple other satellite areas here that are infarcted as well. This may not be the world's best classical picture of a splenic infarct, but it is. Okay, tumors of the spleen. Take a look at them. What's the one thing about all of these tumors of the primary tumors of the spleen, which are relatively weird, they have in common. Yeah, they're all connective tissue. You notice that? None of them are epithelial, and that's very, very logical because how many epithelial cells does the spleen have? Normally, zero. So if there are zero epithelial cells that normally uh, make up the histology of the spleen. You wouldn't expect any carcinomas, would you? So uh, most of the uh, primary tumors of the spleen, which are relatively rare, would be things like uh, blood vessel tumors, uh, lymph vessel tumors, tumors of fibroblasts, even tumors of bone, tumors of cartilage. They are all what would you call mesenchymal tumors. And most of them are benign, but you know, there could be malignant ones. And of course, the big one at the very bottom is that because the spleen is a lymphoid organ, 
it would be very, very understandable that a primary lymphoma of the spleen uh, would be very, very possible as well. Okay, so when we said that lymphomas are malignancies of lymphoid tissue, a lot of people think that means lymph nodes, but you can have a primary lymphoma of the spleen. Okay, let's go into a couple of miscellaneous uh, diseases. Technically, something I've never seen in my life, but it's possible, it's been described as just some congenital absence of a spleen due to some embryologic uh, error. Uh, accessory spleens are pretty common, actually. And um, accessory spleens are more common in people that have splenomegaly than people that don't have splenomegaly. And doesn't that make sense? Because if your spleen is enlarged due to any functional reason, then perhaps very minute, small, microscopic, accessory splenic tissue could become enlarged as well. So when you see a spleen that's enlarged functionally, uh, take a good look to see if there's some not little spleens around them. And they're usually the size of a, of a small grape. That's generally the size of an accessory spleen. Usually they're much, much smaller than the main spleen. And of course, rupture. And this is what I was uh, uh, thinking of before, is that a, a ruptured spleen is probably uh, the most likely reason nowadays for a splenectomy. And um, when I was doing uh, liver scanning, the general rule was if there was any abnormality in the liver scan at all, in somebody that was brought in after an automobile accident or something like that, the surgeon whacked out the spleen only because, you know, a rupture of a splenic capsule can result in death. So even though people thought in those days that there was some general reason for having a spleen, that was not really important or uh, that vital compared to uh, a splenic capsule rupturing, which could frequently be fatal. So the general rule was take out every abnormal spleen uh, in somebody with abdominal pain or bleeding or drop of hematocrit, you know, after an auto accident. Now, I think it's probably just as lucky to try to repair the splenic capsular defect rather than just do a splenectomy. Of course, some of the uh, uh, splenic ruptures, some of the splenic trauma are so bad, uh, they could just be like a pile of mush, so there's no way you could repair it. And those, are, of course, are just taken out and frequently, you know, life-saving, you know, just absolutely life-saving. Let's say a few words about the last remaining lymphoid organ, uh, which doesn't have a large family of diseases, but many people regard it as the most important lymphoid organ, you know, the mother of all T lymphocytes, you know, the thymus. And probably one reason why we neglect this poor thymus is if you remember when you did your anatomy dissections last year, you may have asked yourself, well, where the hell is the thymus, okay? You know, we know it's an important organ. We know that it's supposed to have the thymocytes and the epithelial cells and the hassle, but where the hell is it? Well, in older people, the thymus uh, recedes, and very often it's replaced by chiefly, you know, fatty tissue. In a newborn, the thymus is often about the size of the heart, okay? It's one of the largest things in the thoracic cavity. I should say the superior uh, uh, mediastinum. And very often in older people, when you look for the thymus, you'll never find it. If you carefully dissect under the manubrium of the sternum, you may see a piece of fat, and you may say, so what? What the hell is this? Let's keep looking for the thymus. But the fact is, uh, that could very well be the thymus, okay? So uh, basically, thymus is atrophic in older people, and those are the people that have donated their bodies to your anatomy lab. And of course, if you do autopsies on newborns, you open up the chest, and often the biggest first thing that you see is the thymus, composed of thymocytes, you know, those are the T cells, and epithelial cells, which uh, 
direct and control and nurture. Uh, one of the names for this were nurse cells called the epithelial reticular cells. Those are the two kinds of cells. And the thymocytes look like regular lymphocytes, and the epithelial reticular cells looks like epithelial cells. And sometimes the epithelial reticular cells form these little swirled bodies called Hassel's corpuscles. So as an immediate uh, pattern recognition thing, if you see something like this in any lymphoid organ, you know it's the thymus. There's nothing else in the body that normally looks like this. So probably 80% of the cells, 90% here are your T cells, and then you have your epithelial cells, sometimes forming little swirls. And the general rule is, is that the thymus is a mother of all T lymphocytes, but in the process of it developing, these epithelial cells basically uh, kill or send the signals to kill any T lymphocyte which is involved in self-recognition. So the thymus is also basically the mother of all autoimmune diseases. And if people have autoimmune diseases in which T lymphocytes are attacking its own antigens or failure of the major histocompatibility complex, chances are that it may have gone on you know, very early in life in the spleen. And by the way, I, I think the statistics are something like 99 point something percent of the T lymphocytes in the spleen don't make it. They, got, they die. They go to apoptosis. And uh, only the ones that are 100 percent kosher, you know, 100 percent pure, uh, and uh, do not have any possibility of attacking anything in the body are allowed to be a living thymic lymphocyte. Do you remember when we talked on genetics, we said that there was a chromosomal deletion syndrome. Some people call it DeGeorge syndrome. Some people call it velocardiofacial because it also involves uh, congenital anomalies in the face and in the heart. And one of the th parts of that syndrome uh, was the George syndrome. And do you remember we said that patients with this chromosomal deletion, one of the more common chromosomal genetic diseases, was thymic hypoplasia. Now, the differentiation between hypoplasia and aplasia is very, very fuzzy. You know, it's not really a good differentiation. So some people that have thymic hypoplasia might be called aplastic. But think about it. The patients that have the syndrome basically have severe, severe problems or absences of their T cells. So as you would guess, this could be a very, very severe disease because now you have to start to go through life without any T cells and you may not make it very far. Uh, I think that little cysts that you can see in the thymus uh, are common. Um, I, I would not say fatty infiltration is a common disease. It's, it seems to be a, a thing that happens with all of the thymuses when they involute, when patients get older. And of course, we have to say a couple of words about thymomas as well. And I know what you're thinking already. You're thinking, well, if uh, the thymus is composed uh, of T uh, lymphocytes, then why don't you just call them lymphomas? I guess you could. I guess you could call a thymoma a lymphoma of the thymus, but nobody does. They're all called thymomas. And also remember, uh, thymomas are not just lymphocytes. They're also lymphocytes and epithelial cells. So no other lymphoid organ, you know, not the spleen, not lymph nodes, have epithelial cells, but the thymus does. So it's not, uh, it's, it, it's very easy to understand that the thymomas of the spleen may have a strong lymphoid looking component, but they are also going to have epithelial cells. They're what they call biphasic, okay? So let's talk about thymomas in general. We said that because the thymus normally has both lymphocytes and epithelial cells, when you look at them, 
it is probably better to call that a lymphoepithelioma rather than just a lymphoma, simply because you're going to see epithelial-looking cells as well. Now, uh, I think you could say it's an easy classification of the thymomas uh, from a, a behavioral point of view. In the thymomas that stay in one place, often very well encapsulated, I think you could use the word benign, okay? And that's independent of what the cells may look like microscopically. If it's encapsulated, stays localized, that's benign. Now, what if it doesn't stay encapsulated and isolated? Let's say that it infiltrates. Well, then you would call that malignant thymoma grade one, okay, or category one, perhaps. And it's locally invasive. Now, is it possible that you could have a malignant thymoma that also metastasizes, you know, much way any malignant tumor can metastasize anywhere in the body? And yes, it is possible. I have never seen one, but it's possible. So that would be your malignant thymoma category three. Now, I'm going to show you as our final slide a bunch of uh, pictures here. And please do not get spooked by them because I can tell you without a doubt, I could show, I could take off this little, uh, um, lettering at the top, and I could show these three pictures to, you know, my smartest pathology friends, and I could say to them, what is this? And probably not any of them would think of thymoma. But if you look at these pictures, especially the one here on the upper right, you could say, well, you have a pro if it's a tumor, and you have proliferation of both lymphocytic looking cells, which are clustered here and here and here and here and here, as well as epithelial looking cells, but they don't look terribly malignant microscopically. This would be a classical appearance of a lymphoepithelioma. In this picture over here, it looks like the epithelial part is the predominant part with perhaps only a small scattering of, you know, 10 or 12 lymphocytes around the place. Now, in the one in the bottom, I think you will agree that these bluer areas, you know, look lymphoid, but they look extremely hypercellular. And, you know, we don't have the microscope, but they could very well have a lot of nuclear aberrations as well. But what else do they have? Necrosis. Look at that. So that's why, from a conceptual point of view, you would have to guess that if these are your three categories of lymphomas, the one with necrosis would be the most likely to invade and metastasize, whereas the ones that do not look terribly bad might not metastasize. So technically, as long as we're given the answers, here is your so-called benign thymoma up here in the northwest. Here is your locally invasive thymoma or lymphoepithelioma in the northeast. And here's your malignant thymoma, you know, showing necrosis and extreme hypercellularity in the south. Now, look, you never saw the capsule on any of these, did you? <coughs> Excuse me. All you see are cells, but this is the one that's most likely to be encapsulated. Okay, that would, prob that would probably be a good question to say, look at these three lymphoepitheliomas, and I'll say, which one has the greatest predominance of epithelial-looking cells versus lymphocytes? So that's my first question. And you could answer it. Okay, A, you call it A or North, West, whatever you want. So which is the one that has what looks like might be necrosis? The lower one. And which is the one that clearly looks the most lymphoepithelial in that it has both lymphoid clusters as well as a lot of epithelial clusters? Yeah, and that's B. So you got the general idea. And, of course... To make the diagnosis, though, I don't think anybody would ever make any diagnosis of thymoma unless they looked at it grossly. And 
to see whether it invaded its own capsule or not. Okay, we're done with the discussion of uh, white blood cell disorders, including lymphoid disorders. Uh, oh, my God, we've taken a whole hour already. Uh, well, I'll tell you what. Rather than just start in on the lab and then take a break right away, I want thank you for your attention. I didn't realize that we... Uh, <clears throat> took such a long time to finish up this chapter, but we're going to take our break now, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to go to lab. So when you come back from break, I want you to have your lab coats on, and I want you to, uh, you know, bring your microscopes with you, and I want you to bring the key to your slide box, and we're going to go up to the lab, and also bring your masks because we don't want you to uh, pass over from the formalin fumes. And we come back from the break, we're going to be looking at about 20 slides. About a third of these will be actually peripheral smears or bone marrow smears, you know, things that we've talked about in the last four sessions. And some of them will be, you know, histologic diseases of, you know, marrow or spleen. And that's a, these are exactly the slides we'll be looking at when we come back. So having said that, see you in uh, about... 10 minutes, folks.
Well, looks like we're back. <clears throat> uh, wasn't that uh, watermelon and fruit carving something spectacular? I, I saw a picture of one the other day, and I thought, wow, I'd like to see more of this stuff. I'd maybe even like to learn it. Um, I, just a couple of uh, poll questions very quickly before we start and make a couple of other announcements. Was the audio and video <clears throat> very, very good in the first half? Yes, okay. And uh, the second question was, you know, I generally choose the music that I like the best, you know, the music that I grew up to and the music, uh, you know, that I still like. Uh, I would just want to ask you, do you generally like my music? Okay, I'm prepared for the worst, but I'm seeing mostly yeses here. It's something, you know what, I wish you like it. I know I like it. When I like it, I feel good. And when I feel good, <clears throat> I can be more spontaneous and educational during these sessions here. Okay, uh, I feel pretty good today. Um, I feel pretty smart because uh, we had all these uh, RAM problems here the other day with the computer. And I was even thinking of getting a new one. They were so bad. But then I just went over to the store and I bought... Uh, an extra gigabyte of RAM. I increased my RAM from one to two gigabytes on my computer, and it seems like all the problems are gone. It's working so much faster and nicer. It's tolerating so much more intensive video, and uh, I feel really good. Uh, I was feeling bad this morning because I had to spank my dog pretty badly last night. He escaped again. Usually when he takes his little uh, walks at night, he comes back in five minutes. But he was gone for over a half hour, so I walked over to the police station, which is about a block away, and they had him. You know, whenever somebody in my town sees a dog without a leash, they call the police, you know. So Woofy was busted. He's at the police station again. They fined me $20, and I had to give Woofy a big spanking, which I don't like to do. He's only had about two or three in his life, but I hope he has learned. Plus, I was angry as well. So are we all in lab now? Good. Now that we're all in lab, let's look at our slides. Whoops, I just clicked on the wrong thing. How about if we shut down this? That was our PowerPoint. Here's the lab down here. The difference between uh, labs <clears throat> for the chapter on blood cells and labs in other areas is that we look at the peripheral smears a lot more. So let's find out, after bragging about how great my RAM is, let's see if we could get this folder to open over here because uh, there seems to be a little bit of a delay. Here we go. Every, does everybody see the thumbnails of the uh, cases we're going to be looking at? And I'm guessing you're going to say yes. Okay, here's our normals here. We can't really look at much until you look at the normals. Now, normally I don't like to use the online viewers because they interfere with the bandwidth of the webinar. But now that I've increased my RAM, let's see if we could look at a couple of uh, online slides. I guess a good place to start would be a normal peripheral smear. This might be a little bit longer to uh, appear than the other ones. Whoops. No, it won't. It's going to be pretty fast. Okay, there's your office. You have a little office, uh, and you take a drop of blood from your patients, and you smear it out nicely, and you use the right stain, and you're basically looking at a bunch of red cells. But if you remember... The white cells are about one five hundredth as common. So for about every 500 red cells, you're going to see a, a, a white cell approximately. And also the platelets are not one thousandth or one five hundredth as common. They might be about one twentieth as common. So there's your nice little smear. Okay, it's a little bit thicker in this area, but there's a lot of places where we could look at cells. So... Oh, I don't know. Let's just random the uh, center part here. Look how beautiful they are. Instantly, you could see not only thousands of red cells, and they all look like they're pretty round. They all look like they have a nice little uh, pale area in the middle. 
uh, you can also see that the uh, dots of uh, white cells, you can already see that this one, this one, this one, and this one are in the uh, granulocytic series, you know, leukocytes, neutrophils. You can also see the ones that look like they have almost just only a nucleus are probably lymphocytes, so there and there. And these might actually be uh, monocytes over here. So we're seeing in about the uh, numbers that we want to. Also, even at this low power, can you see, for example, about four or five platelets within this circle? Can you see that or not? Yeah, isn't that great? So, I don't know, maybe this would be a nice place to zoom up a little bit more. Look at that. Those are your beautiful red cells. They all look like they're pretty much the same size with respect to each other. So the RDW on your computer spit out would be low. Uh, they're the same shape. They're the same size. So you would not call this anisocytosis or poikilocytosis. And every now and then you could see a platelet approximately uh, 1 20th as often as you see the red cell. So there's one, there's one, there's one, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. I'm seeing about 18 or 19 uh, platelets, do you agree? And let's say you see a couple of thousand or, you know, more than a thousand red cells here. Well, it's not unusual they're going to find maybe one or two white cells. Now, there is your most popular and frequent white cell, a neutrophilic granulocyte. You can see it has three lobes. You can see that the lobes, do you see how the lobes are connected by a fine, tiny little string? Isn't that something? Yeah, you call them a poly. And you also see, like, with the lymphocyte, it almost looks like it's a pure nucleus, but there's a little lip of cytoplasm. And remember we said that these small lymphocytes are approximately, pretty reliably, about 10 microns in diameter, which is probably 2 or 3 microns more than the average diameter of your red cell. So this is like the per most perfect thing to show you. I don't know what else we could do. We could probably look around and find uh, an eosinophil or a basophil and... Actually, that would take a lot of time, so you know what we're going to do? We're going to go back down, and I think somebody put arrows here to show you that even though basophils are rare, you might have to look for, you know, 20 minutes to find one. There's something here at the tips of the arrows, and I think I remember one of them was a basophil. Yeah, look at that. Remember, I told you that basophils are frequently mistaken for lymphocytes, because the granules are so dense that they kind of obscure the nucleus. So there's a lymphocyte there. There's a four-lobed poly over there. There's a lymphocyte there. But believe it or not, I bet you this thing here is a basophil. Be oh, yeah, look how, how dark and coarse the granules are. So that's like only about less than 1%, maybe half percent basophils. So I'm glad that the arrow was there because it saved us 10 minutes of wasting our time. Uh, what else do we want to find? I'll tell you what, let's just go through this uh, northeast area here, and I'm just going to make the rest of this kind of a quiz. I'm just going to ask you to identify all these cells. Okay, let's make it easy. What's this cell over here? Just, you know, spit it out. Okay, what's this cell over here? Spit it out. What's this cell over here? Spit it out. What's this cell over here? Uh, what's this cell over here, by the way? Right here, what's that? Yeah, you're right, it's a lymph. And what is this over here? What is this? Yeah, it's a mono. You can't, you know, I can't fool you today. Um... I also want you to remember, uh, some people are, get so hung up on finding all these neat little things that they very often neglect to uh, realize that you got to see an occasional platelet, okay? We said they're about 1 20th as common as the red cells, uh, give or take a factor of one. So don't forget, anything that's a lot smaller than a red cell but looks sort of round and uh, is probably going to be a platelet. 
because it stains generally a little bit uh, bluer, you know, like the white cells do. And uh, there's a platelet that is standing next to a red cell or in between red cells. But there's a platelet that happens to be on the edge of the red cell. I'm telling you this because a lot of times when you're looking at a malaria smear, you might see a platelet that's overriding a, a red cell, and you might think it's part of a malarial organism. And, yeah, we'll, we'll say platelets are maybe one or two microns. I would say somebody said one micron, but, look, if that's seven from there to there, if from there to there is seven microns, then how big is that platelet? You want to say two or one? Certainly not bigger than three, that's for sure, right? Yeah, 1.5, there you go. Okay, so we're done with a general feel of a normal peripheral smear. That's good. I don't want to beat this uh, any much longer. Now, let's go to a normal marrow smear. Now, the first thing you could tell is that there's a lot of these fatty spaces there, right? Because remember, the marrow is 50% fat, so it's not unusual that these fat even show up on the smear when you smear the aspirated marrow material on a slide. Another thing you could realize is that there's a lot more nucleated cells here than there are red cells because this is, you know, a, something that's supposed to be about 50% cellular. Now, what's the third thing that hits you real big? In other words, what is that cell? What is that cell? What is that cell? What is that cell? Yeah, they're all megakaryocytes. So that instantly tells you that I told you that you normally might want to see one or two megakaryocytes per high power field. And this is a little bit lower than a high power field. So let's say that a high power field is about one fourth of this. If you looked at this fourth, you might say, oh, there's one. If you looked at this one, you might say one. So it's usually one or two, maybe none, maybe three. And that's a good general feel. Now let's take a bigger look at the megakaryocyte too, because a lot of times when you are looking at extra medullary marrow activity, sometimes you're not sure what the hell those nucleated cells are, but if you see megakaryocytes, look at that. Isn't that a beautiful megakaryocyte right there? Okay, now, here's an important question. We told you that in the peripheral smear, the red cells are about 500 to 1,000 times more popular than the nucleated white cells. Now, in the marrow, the ratio is reversed. You erase all of these non-nucleated red cells. The ratio between nucleated white cells and nucleated red cells is about 3 to 1. And some of the books will say 4 to 1, maybe 5 to 1, but 3 to 1 is, you know, generally a good uh, number to go by. What I'm going to do is blow up this area right here. And without going into the all of the names of the cells, you know that's a white precursor. That's probably either a late metamyelocyte or an early band. That's probably a myelocyte. There's a band also called a stab. That could be a monocyte, I'm not sure. There's, uh, that's probably a red precursor there. That's probably a red precursor there. That's probably a red precursor there. Normoblasts or rubroblasts of various stages of development. So what I want you to do is just look at this picture again. There's a, a nucleated red. You notice how the nuclei of the red cells are smaller and denser. Whoops, I, my guy is telling me there might be a sound problem. Can you hear me? Okay, good. It was a false alarm. Okay, you should notice that the nuclei of the red precursors are smaller 
and denser. There's a couple there, there's three over there, there's three or four over here, there's one there. But most of these are probably white cell precursors. So let me ask you the key question. What is the ME ratio in this field? And you're saying about three to one, and that's what I would say too. Okay, good. Uh, I'm going to show you another uh, feature of this thing over here. And we're going to close this guy. And I think there's an arrow here somewhere. Oh, help me find the arrow. Does anybody see the... Oh, here, is this the arrow? Here, let's take a look over here. This is an important thing here. I hope that this is an arrow. Yeah. Here's the question. What is this cell at the tip of the arrow that's crucially important? It has a nucleolus, doesn't it? And it has no granules of any type whatsoever in the cytoplasm. That's a blast. What should the percentage of blast cells in the bone marrow normally be? I'll give you three choices, 1%, 10%, or 50%. And you're all saying way low, like 1% or 2%. Let's say that 50% uh, or 30% of the cells in the marrow had were classical blast cells. What's your diagnosis? If you see more than 20% of blasts, in a bone marrow, what is your diagnosis? Acute leukemia. You're absolutely right. Thank you very much. That's so important. Now, here's the next question. What is the normal number of blasts in a peripheral smear? Here's the possibilities. 0%, 2%, or 8%. 0%. Very important. So the recognition of a blast with a nucleolus is critically important. Okay, good. I think we're done, and we're not going to go through all of the cells, but you know that's a... Oh, here's, a, here's another general rule I think you should keep in mind. When you look at all of the nucleated cells in this field, which are predominantly uh, neutrophils, you know, there's a lymphocyte over there, and that might be, I don't really see any erythroids in here, but I do see a lymphocyte here and maybe there too. That could be a monocyte. That could be a, maybe a lymph. I don't know. But let me ask you this. Of all the nucleated cells in this field, what percentage of them are bands or polymorphonuclear mature granulocytes? Somebody said 50, some said 35, some said 40. Okay, here's the answer. Here's a general rule. About one-third of the myeloid cells should be bands or granulocytes. So about half, maybe a third is, is the answer. Because let's say, for example, that it was not one-third. Let's say it was only one-tenth then that means there's a left shift, isn't there? And there's going to be a shift towards the earlier cells of maturation, like the myelocytes, the metamyelocytes. So keep in mind about one-third. Now, um, remember I told you that about, oh, maybe only a couple percent of the cells in the bone marrow should be lymphs? There's almost certainly one over there, and there's one probably over there. So you could see lymphocytes and lymphocyte precursors is just a couple of percent in the bone marrow. And can I ask you one more question before we move on? How many cells in this smear are plasma cells? Do you see even one solidly good classical plasma cell? Yes or no? I don't see any. You know, maybe if you bought me a beer, you could convince me that this might be one over here. Uh, but I don't really see anything here I would call a plasma cell. So what if 
plasma cells were 20% of your marrow cells. What's your diagnosis? Multiple myeloma, absolutely. Let's say that plasma cells were more than a couple of percents, but less than 20%. But when you look at the marrow, uh, when you cut it, they're often in sheets of, you know, 20 of them together. Then what's your diagnosis for that? That's also multiple myeloma, isn't it? Okay, good. Um, let's uh, say that we have a good understanding of the marrow now. And by the way, you know what we'll do also? Let's just keep driving around until we see one nice megakaryocyte, and then we'll call it a day. Ah, there you go. There's a megakaryocyte. And by the way, sometimes when you look at the megakaryocytes, you can see like little purple particles in their cytoplasm, like maybe there, and you think, oh, looks like our megakaryocyte is doing what they normally do, and that's to pinch off platelets. Okay, and look, there's a little cluster of platelets right over there, isn't there? Okay, so much for that. Let's go on to the next case. Uh, the next thing I have here is called a normal marrow, but now, rather than being a smear like we've seen with the Giemza stain, now it's a cut section through a bone. And by the way, what bone would this almost certainly have to be? We said in adult, you normally don't get marrow in your long extremity bones. So what are your long bones of the axial skeleton, a rib? This is almost certainly a rib if this is an adult. And here's the next question. Even before we zoom in and we just look at the thumbnail here, what percentage of the marrow here is fat versus blood cells. Here, let me uh, help you a little bit because I'll zoom on in this area. What percent is fat? What percent is hematopoietic cells? Yeah, I'd call it 50 also. And by the way, I'm going to I'm going to point to five cells right now and you got to tell me what they are. That one, that one, that one, that one, and that one. Oh, that one. What are all those? Yeah, those are megas. See how they stand out? Now, you don't see the differentiation now, uh, the identification of the cells very well, because this is not a good stain for that. But it is a good stain for looking at uh, the general cellularity. Now, do you remember, even though this stain cannot really often differentiate well as to what kind of cell it is. Do you know that certain cells like here and 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 probably here and maybe a couple over here. Do you see that there seems to be two populations of cells, the nucleated cells that have the much smaller, denser nucleus those are probably erythroids, aren't they? And it looks like they are greatly outnumbered, maybe three to one, by the cells that have a larger, less dense nucleus. These are the other white cell precursors. So even though you can't really identify these cells very great, you can tell what the cellularity is. And you can tell generally what the ME ratio is if you have a lot of good experience. Okay, um, what else do we want to say? Oh, something very important. When you patient gets a hematology consult, your patient comes in with anemia or some blood disorder, so you refer them to the hematologist, or maybe the pathologist can even will do the bone marrow. Uh, but you are then going to realize that your patient, once they suck out that marrow, is not only going to be looked at with the Giemza stain of the smear, but it will also be looked at with an H and E stain of the clot to assess the cellularity better. For example, you can't see granulomas on a smear, but you could see granulomas in a surgical cut clot section. Okay, and just out of curiosity, 
You see this little thing here? I'm kind of putting my arrow around it. What is that cell? Almost certainly. Come on, give me a guess. If you could see my arrow. Yeah, this is a poly. This is a neutrophil. Sometimes you could even f figure out there's probably a poly there. There's probably a poly there. That's probably a poly. So remember we said that about one-third of all of the non-normal uh, blast cells or the white cells should be polys or metamyelocytes. Okay, does anybody want to look for a plasma cell with me, or do you think we shouldn't waste our time? That could be a plasma cell. Do you see how the chromatin is at the edge of the uh, nucleus? And do you see how it has kind of like a lip, a wider lip? That could be a plasma cell. So maybe out of these couple of hundred cells, maybe we see one or two plasma cells, which is normal. Okay, good. We're done with this case. By the way, are we going too fast or are we going too slow or just right? Is the porridge too hot, too cold, or just right? Okay, that's what I thought. I don't want to spend too much time. Um, okay, now here's something that we should really understand as well. This we've seen before as a static picture in our lecture, and now we're going to see it as a microscopic slide in the lab. You all know this is a lymph node. You all know this is a normal lymph node. Now, rather than being hung up on the names of all the stupid little areas, I want you to remember one thing. The follicles are at the periphery, or in other words, the chief component of the cortex and the medulla chief component are these sinuses, okay? Now let's say, for example, that, oh, let's look over here. This, no, that would not be a good, yeah, let's look maybe here. Yeah, let's take this area here. What do you call the sinus that's right underneath the capsule where the first metastatic cell might enter? That's a subcapsular sinus. Do you see how the subcapsular sinuses lead into these trabecula, which separate the follicles or go between the follicles? That's a trabecular sinus. And then the sinuses are quite abundant. All of these white light areas are sinuses in the medulla. So let's go back to low power because I don't want to go into all the details with you. It's not necessary. I want you to take a firm visual understanding that you have the follicles in the cortex and the straighter medullary sinuses in the medulla. Every normal lymph node must have that. Now, for example, if you slice this lymph node like this way, you might not see any medulla. You might think it's all follicles, you know. And you might say, oh, maybe I should call this a follicular lymphoma if I don't see medullary sinuses. Well, if you slice the lymph node right down the middle, you're going to see medullary sinuses. Now, I'm not going to make you stand and raise your hand when I tell you this. You don't have to repeat it after me standing up but you do have to repeat it after me out loud right now. In every malignant lymphoma, did you repeat that? Did you repeat that out loud? In every malignant lymphoma, you have effacement or destruction of the differentiation between cortical follicles and medullary sinuses. So if you have a lymph node that looks lymphoid, maybe there's a lot of follicles, maybe there's a lot of lymphocytes, but you don't see a good differentiation between the two, there, there's a good chance that's a malignant lymphoma. And by the way, that's the easy diagnosis. The even easier diagnosis is to say, and remember this, if you see even one true epithelial structure or epithelial gland in a lymph node, 
most likely it's metastatic. Now, there is a small exception to that, and we told you that if this lymph node was draining an area of a skin infection and some of the squamous epithelial cells happen to enter the lymph node, that's what they call a dermatopathic lymph node. But for the most part, a general rule, every epithelial cell in a lymph node is metastatic until proven otherwise. And when you send your patients uh, to the uh, oncologist and to the pathologist and you get the pathology report of a lymphoma or a malignant lymphoma, the report is always going to start out by saying the normal cortical medullary architecture is effaced. And I'm going to spare you the agony of showing you, you know, the 35 different times types of confusing lymphomas. That's the deal. Because even if you learned them, guess what? By the time you graduate from medical school, there's going to be a new classification. So don't bother. Okay, that's a normal lymph node. We got one more normal thing to show you. And that's a normal spleen. And that'll cover all of the things we talked about for the last uh, four days. What are the blue areas? What kind of pulp is the blue areas? Is that white pulp or red pulp? Yeah. What about the non-blue uh, areas, the stuff in between? Is that red pulp or white pulp? So here, here's the question. The area here that you're calling red pulp, what color is it grossly when you cut the spleen at autopsy? It's also red, isn't it? Now, the area here that's blue, what color is that grossly when you cut it on the table? It's white. So you could say red pulp and white pulp grossly or red pulp and blue pulp microscopically. What is the ratio between the red pulp and the blue pulp or the white pulp? What's the ratio approximately? Right here. It's, somebody said 60-40. I would have said 50-50, but 60-40 sounds pretty good, except I don't know which is the 60 and which is the 40. So I would say about half. I think, you could, I think most of the big uh, brilliant hematologists and hematopathologists would say it's probably more red than white. But, you know, that, let's just say 50-50. Now, if the spleen, if, let's say this was a normal-sized spleen, 150 grams, Let's say that it was enlarged to uh, 500 grams. And it was enlarged because of a hemolytic anemia or portal hypertension. Then what do you think the ratio would be between red pulp and white pulp? It would be a lot more red or a lot more white. Yeah, it would be a lot more red. You're right. Now, let's say that it was enlarged because it was infiltrated with leukemia or lymphoma, an infiltrate of splenomegaly rather than a congestive splenomegaly. Then what would be the predominant color, red or white? Okay, you got the whole idea. You want to know something? In my opinion, when you learn pathology, it's more important to uh, uh, understand a concept like that than actually uh, memorize a long laundry list of, you know, splenomegaly. And a last question, what do you call that little piece of fibrous tissue there? And there, and there. And I bet if you looked at it, you'll see that big arteries are running inside of them. Those are your trabeculae, aren't they? Okay, so this is the general uh, concept of a normal spleen microscopically from a pathologist's point of view. There is no need to memorize, you know, the 20 different kinds of cells. You have to understand the big picture. Good. We're done with all our normal stuff, so let's go into some of the abnormal stuff now. And we're going to go into the abnormal stuff uh, randomly or alphabetically uh, with all of the things we talked about. This first picture is... Uh, I hope my RAM handles it. This is from an online viewer because I don't have an offline picture of this. But I know you're going to see it. You're just not going to see it as fast as the other ones. So I think you already know what this is because you can see the label. But forget about the label. I want to ask you a question. 
when you're looking at this peripheral smear and you know that these dotted white cells are not one thousandth as common as the red cells, but it looks like they're 10 or 20 or 100 times increased. What would you call it if you looked at those nucleated white cells and they all happen to be blasts? So if the normal white cell is about one five hundredth or one one thousandth as common as a red cell, if the normal white cell count is, let's say, six to ten thousand, what do you think this patient's white cell count might have been? You think it could easily have been something like a hundred thousand? Is that a classical, is that a typical number? Five, fifty thousand, a hundred thousand? Okay. Final question, because I know you could see it now, and I'm going to zoom up on the, a little bit more, because I know this goes to 40x. What is almost every cell in that field? Does that cell have a nuclear list? 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 These are all blasts, okay? Now I'm going to ask you a trick question. Are these myeloblasts or are these lymphoblasts? Or is a blast is a blast is a blast is a blast is a blast? Right. Don't ever be a fool and try to characterize the type of blast because you could very well be wrong and you might kill your patient by giving them the wrong classification. And remember, there's a lot of ways to identify these with markers as well. But from the point of view of you, a practicing physician, who might have a little lab in your office, you need to know what a blast looks like. And you all do, so we'll move on to the next case. Here's another uh, smear, by the way. And these have to be looked at with the online viewer because I don't have them in the offline uh, slide box. Okay, now you can see there's another uh, smear. And you can also see that the nucleated cells are greatly larger than they should be. This is not a normal five to 10,000 white count. This could be 20, 30, 40. Okay, it's greatly increased, right? Now, before you tend to uh, get smart on me, I'm going to click up a no couple more notches to 40, and I want to ask you a question. Do the majority of these cells all look like normal lymphocytes? Yes or no? They don't have blasts and they're not lobulated. Okay, good. Second question is, do you see how there are some cells like here and here and here and maybe here and here and here that don't have cytoplasm? It looks like a basket nucleus. There's no cytoplasm. Yeah, we call these smudge cells or basket cells. Sometimes you see them normally, but there's an awful lot here. This is also typical of chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And by the way, um, what about the platelets here? Do you see a good number of platelets, a normal number of platelets, an increased number of platelets, a low number of platelets? You can certainly have no trouble finding platelets. However, they seem to be a little reduced, don't they? Now remember, you're not supposed to have significant thrombocytopenia in the chronic leukemias. But if the chronic leukemia gets more advanced and more of the bone marrow and more of the lymph nodes, more of the bone marrow is involved, yeah, in the more advanced chronic lymphocytic leukemias, you can get thrombocytopenia. And here's the final question. Would you ever be a fool 
and try to diagnose a cell without seeing cytoplasm. Everybody who tries to diagnose a, a cell without cytoplasm is a fool. So in other words, you can recognize uh, the cell by the, that it has a nucleus, but you can categorize the cell by the cytoplasm. Does that look like a perfectly normal lymphocyte? Does that like a, look like a perfectly normal lymphocyte? Does that look like a perfectly normal? So if we said the normal white count is, let's say, five to 10,000, and about 20% of them should be lymphocytes. So if you do the math, that means that, oh, maybe one or 2,000 cells are normally uh, lymphocytes per cubic millimeter. That's your absolute lymphocyte count, one or 2,000. But let's say this person had three, four, five thousand 5,000 normal-looking lymphocytes, and they're, and they're over age 60. They probably have chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Chronic lymphocytic leukemia can be diagnosed without even looking at the smear and without even doing a bone marrow. But you do one anyway. Okay, good. So much for CLL. Let's go to our next and final uh, slide that has a online viewer, and then we'll move into the slides that we'll look at much more quickly. Okay, looks like it's another peripheral smear, and it also looks like the white cells are very, very, very massively increased. And of course, if they all look like blast, then it's an easy diagnosis, right? But let's not jump the gun. Let's make sure these are either all blasts or not all blasts. Oh my God, there's a lot of uh, neutrophils that are mature. There's a lot of bands. Oh, look at there's probably a myelocyte, or there's a metamyelocyte. So you have a massively increased white cell count, but very, very few blasts. Oh, I bet you I could find a blast. That's probably a blast over there. Um, I don't know if I'd call that a blast. But I could see maybe there's a blast. You see the nucleolus there? There's a blast. So there's a couple. There's a blast. That might be it. So there's two, three, five at the most percent blasts. But most of the cells are in the myeloid series. So is this an acute or a chronic myelogenous leukemia. Yeah, you all know it's chronic. Thank you. And let me ask you this. Let's say that more than, oh, 20 percent of the cells, or actually I think if for, a smear, if for a smear it's less, let's say that a significant number of these cells, let's forget about the percentage, were blasts more than a couple of percent, then would you say maybe this is a chronic myelogenous leukemia that's going into a blast crisis? Absolutely. And by the way, do you see a good number of platelets, uh, an increased number of platelets, or a decreased number of platelets? It looks like the platelets are a little decreased. I can see one here, one here, one here, one here. But it looks like they're a little bit decreased. But remember, in chronic myelogenous leukemia, you can have an increase of platelets. You can have an increase of white cell, uh, red cells as well. Remember, this is a myeloproliferative. You have proliferation of all three lines. But the prominent expression is in your myeloid cells, not your platelets, and not your red cells. If the primary myeloproliferative expression was in platelets, you'd probably call that an essential thrombos thrombostenia or an essential thrombocytosis. If your prominent peripheral expression was in red cells, now rather than having a hemoglobin of 15, it's up to 17, 18, then you'd call that P. vera. So remember, all the myeloproliferative disorders are related. Okay, I don't want to, uh, 
Oh, also, remember, you can have also an increase in eosinophils and basophils as well. But uh, they're not specific. Oh, look at there's an eosinophil. You see that? Uh, when you have an increase in eosinophils and basophils in chronic myelogenous leukemia, they're nonspecific. There's also increased numbers of all the other cells as well. And remember, we said that we don't know of anything that causes a specific increase in uh, basophils, but when you do have an absolute increase, it's probably going to be a CML. And by the way, what is that cell right there at the tip of the arrow? It's the most classical kind of cell. Yeah, it's the most, world's most perfect eosinophil. Now, when the stains or the machines do the staining or the techs do the staining, uh, often sometimes they're a little bit heavy on the red or they're a little bit light on the blue. But no matter what the technical uh, features are, the eosinophils always have redder and coarser granules than the granulocytes. You see that? You can see some granules there. You can see some granules there. But they're not as coarse and they're not as red as the eosinophils. And I'm going to ask finally the last question to somebody who is really smart. And I expect most people won't get it right. But I'm going to drag you down to this one cell right here at the tip of my arrow. What is that? <laughs> well, some of you got it right. This, to me, is an eosinophil, but it's not mature. I would probably call this an eosinophilic metamyelocyte. Okay? Do you agree that this qualifies as an eosinophilic metamyelocyte? Okay, good. You got the general uh, concept, so let's move on to some of the things now, which we're going to see a lot faster. Next case. You want to give me the organ here? Uh, it's a spleen. But look at this. Most of the spleen is characterized by, oh, some type of eosinophilic hyaline substance. Anybody want to guess that maybe this is amyloidosis of the spleen? It could be necrosis, but when you see something that's hyaline, think of fibrosis, think of fibrin, think of necrosis, but also think of amyloid. And it looks like this spleen is totally infiltrated with amyloid. You don't know it, but that was the name of the slide. You would have to prove it by doing what stain? Yeah, Congo red, of course. Let's go on to the next one. Here is a bone marrow, and it is a biopsy. It's a core biopsy of the bone marrow. You could see that in here. You got, oh, a approximately, let's say, 50-50 ratio of cells to fat, maybe a little bit more. But you can see that there's an area down here which looks like it doesn't have any fat. So you suspect that this is some type of infiltrate. And all the cells look the same, pretty much. And look, many of them have the nucleus displaced by these large vacuoles in the cell. These are signet ring cells. Now, if somebody says, well, could these be could this be an area of multiple myeloma? I would say, well, that's a good conjecture, but in a multiple myeloma, the Golgi apparatus is never big enough to displace the nucleus like a signet ring. So this is a metastatic, whoops, let's see. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Well, I just lost the voice. Whoa. I'm very sorry to lose you. Very, very sorry to lose you.
Okay, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay, the reason why you can probably hear me now is because I freed up some of my RAM. And um, hold on, let's empty the recycle bin too. That's not going to really help, but let's wait for a second. Okay, what can we do? Why is our bandwidth so lousy? Let's get rid of this thing, too. Uh, we got this. Okay, can you hear me now? If you can hear me now, say yes. If you can hear me now, say yes. Yes.